The American Civil War is one of the most written about historical subjects, which isn't surprising when you have so many people and places involved and lives affected for decades after. But this video, however, will focus more narrowly on the alumni of Tuscarora Academy meeting again on both sides of the Gettysburg battlefield. A few other non-Academy Gettysburg soldiers from Juniata County will also be sprinkled in, making this a glorious buffet of interesting history. So this is like actually a connective history, so it's infinitely interesting how lives intersect and fit together kind of like puzzle pieces. But before we start connecting the dots between Tuscarora Academy and the Battle of Gettysburg, we do need to talk a little bit about the events leading up to the Civil War so that we can introduce a few of our real life characters. Many of these stories and more are featured in detail in chapter four of my book on the Tuscarora Academy. So if you are interested in learning more, that's where you'll find it. So in 1859, there was that infamous raid at Harper's Ferry. A story about what happened when the news reached academia was later written about by a Southern student who was attending the academy at the time. His name was Randolph Abbott Shotwell, and he had many things to say about his time in Juniata County. He said, among the youths disembarking at academia, as a matter of course, were a number of Southerners. It was a fashion of the day for Southern parents to send their boys and girls to Northern institutes or seminaries, chiefly because the expense was a great deal heavier and the thing sounded better when talking to their neighbors. But there could be no mistaking the nativity of these Southern youngsters. Tall, dark, long-haired, bryonic collared, so it was quite a surprise to the natives of Tuscarora, who looked for no such good thing to come out of the Southern Nazareth, when my brother Hamilton carried off the first honors and they heard his eloquent young lips pleading for large-hearted patriotism and unity in his valedictory address. It might seem unlikely that lads of so immature an age in this mountain Arcadia, surrounded by the daily distractions of school life, should take any notice of the march of political events. But we watched the pending collision of the sections with a strange fascination and boyish eagerness, which considered only the pomp and circumstance and not the horrors of war. Randolph also talked about being enraged about a Juniata County church elder who practiced thou shalt not steal or covet thy neighbor's property whilst harboring fugitive slaves in his kitchen in the Port Royal area, and how he witnessed a so-called train of the Underground Railroad while he was traveling through the Seven Mountains. Now back to the news about Harper's Ferry. Honest John Patterson, a polarizing character, was residing at the female seminary up the hill from the academy. A born politician, he would often walk down to the post office at the foot of the church hill to talk to the older students and the community members. Now, when the first newspaper arrived after the raid, he was the first one to get the newspaper with the details. So, surrounded by students from all parts of the country and some members of the community, he read the account aloud from his paper. Now, coupled with the alarming news was the tone in which he read. It enraged the Southern boys who began shouting and soon a large heated screaming match broke out. Now, Honest John, he was so enraged that he turned around to walk home, but he paused when he reached his gate and he turned around and said, if your slaveholders do whip John Brown's party, the day will come when they will have the whole North to fight. And the Southern students, they of course were stirred to intense rage and they responded with all sorts of bring it on sentiments. Shotwell later wrote, how little any of us foresaw the future. Scarcely a single year elapsed before the South had indeed the whole North to fight. Not all Northern and Southern students were at odds though. Just a few years before this, Juniata County student James Patterson and Norfolk, Virginia student David Stone became great friends. So great that they went on to become college roommates together at Dickinson. 
The merits of the slavery issue were already hotly debated during their college years, causing campus disputes that kind of grew more embittered over the years. But despite the two having almost certainly different viewpoints, they remained friends and roommates until their graduation in 1859. The following year, they even became brothers-in-law when David married James's sister Isabel. So their friendship would have been heavily tested once the war began and they served on opposing sides. But we're gonna revisit these two and Shotwell once we get to Gettysburg. For the 100th anniversary of Tuscarora Academy, Juniata County resident Helen McLaughlin poignantly wrote, the peace and prosperity of the Academy was disturbed by the threatening clouds of war. For love of home and country, young men, who had been one in spirit, in ideals, and in school training, who had been friends and mates in study hall and on the playground of everyday life, were now called to break these firm bonds and face each other as enemies upon the field of battle. Once the war officially began, the Academy actually offered military drill as part of the curriculum. Two years into the war in 1863, Academy graduate Stephen Pomeroy had just been honorably discharged from his nine months of service and was at his family's home in Roxbury, Franklin County, when the Confederates entered Cumberland Valley. They had cut telegram wires and placed guards everywhere, so it was difficult for word to get out of exactly what was happening. But officials had to rely on scouts or spies to get any information. Out of sheer curiosity, Stephen Pomeroy went to Chambersburg to check out the scenes. Early the next morning, June 30th, Franklin County Judge Kimmel, who knew Pomeroy's father, called Stephen into a secret meeting. He told me that the rebels were concentrating at Gettysburg and that Governor Curtin did not know it. He said it was of the utmost importance that the governor should know at the earliest possible moment and asked me if I would take a telegram to the nearest point on the Pennsylvania Railroad and send it to him. He added, it is of infinite importance to him and to our country. I replied that I would try it. The telegram was already written, so he cut a hole in the buckle strap of my pantaloons and deposited the telegram to be sent there and said, get this safely and in the shortest time possible to the governor. Stephen was only 26 years old at the time, but that day he walked and rode through great dangers for nearly 50 miles, tiring out four horses to deliver the information in hopes that it would save the Union in its time of greatest peril. Locals know that story as Pomeroy's ride. Governor Curtin went years without knowing who sent the anonymous telegram, but by a meeting of chance 20 years later, the truth became known. It was then confirmed by Colonel A.K. McClure, who was with Curtin in Harrisburg the evening that it was sent. McClure said it was the first dispatch received at the executive mansion at Harrisburg, giving the information that Lee was moving towards Gettysburg. Curtin even publicly responded to Pomeroy's written account. My dear sir, your dispatch was the first authentic information I received of the concentration of the army of General Lee in Gettysburg and, treating it as true, acted on it. Yours truly, A.G. Curtin. That full story is told word for word by Stephen in my book, and it includes appearances from other Academy students and faculty. So the morning after that important telegram was sent, all hell was about to break loose in Gettysburg. The same day Stephen Pomeroy was riding like the wind to get to a safe place to send that telegram, General Buford's Union Cavalry Division arrived at Gettysburg. You might remember him from the 1993 movie Gettysburg. He was played by the legendary Sam Elliott. So the next morning, July 1st, the companies, regiments, and brigades under Buford Actually, let's pause for a moment to show how these units were organized so you can kind of see the hierarchy. For the Tuscarora Academy alumni, I'll be talking about their regiments and companies, which were all folded into these larger units, of course. So now within Buford's division was the 8th Illinois Cavalry Regiment. 
In Company L within this regiment was Calvaryman Jeremiah Jordan. Although he was a Juniata County native, after graduating from the academy, he and his family relocated to Illinois. Now it is claimed that the first shot fired at Gettysburg at 7.30 that morning was by Lieutenant Jones, who was in this 8th Illinois Cavalry. So after that shot, Jeremiah and the rest of his fellow cavalrymen under Buford dismounted and successfully held off Heath's Confederate attack for several hours until the Union infantrymen could arrive. So guess who was under Heath's umbrella? our Norfolk native, David Stone. Now, we will talk more about him when we get into the third day, but as I tell this story about day one, just remember that he was there on the other side. It's kind of strange to think that David and Jeremiah were probably both kind of surprised to be back so close to their former school under such circumstances. When General Reynolds arrived with his infantrymen around 10, 15 in the morning, it was a welcome relief as Buford's men were actually pretty outnumbered. So within Reynolds' Corps in General Doubleday's division were many Juniata County infantrymen and at least two Academy alumni. So in the 121st Pennsylvania Regiment was Sergeant Reginald H. Calpland in Company I. Now, he was a Philadelphian native who had graduated from the academy only a few years prior. He probably never imagined that he'd be back so close to his alma mater in those perilous times and probably really strongly wished that he was back at his clerk salesman job in Philadelphia. Now, alongside the 121st Pennsylvania in the same brigade was the 151st Pennsylvania Regiment, which having more than 100 school teachers on its rolls was known as the Teachers Regiment. Company D was organized and recruited by the principal of McAllisterville Academy, George F. McFarland, who became the Lieutenant Colonel of this group. So one of his men was future Academy student, William P. Noble. Although he was born in Path Valley in Franklin County, his family relocated to Van Wert in Juniata County when he was young. General Reynolds' infantrymen fought brutally against the Confederates' attacks, and it bought time for the rest of the Union Army to arrive. These regiments were under constant fire along McPherson's Ridge from about 10.30 in the morning until just after 3. Reynolds was actually killed about 15 minutes after he got there that morning near the edge of the woods that now bear his name. So the area where McFarland's company was fighting was only yards from where Reynolds was killed. So by 3 p.m., a lot of men had been lost. So under the cover of other regiments like the 8th Illinois Cavalry, these companies moved to a new position near the Lutheran Theological Seminary. In this new position, more Confederate reinforcements showed up, so our guys were completely overwhelmed, and in the 151st Regiment alone, they lost nearly 300 men before 420. Lieutenant Colonel McFarland, in relating this experience a year later, said, My horse was shot about 4 p.m. near the seminary, and 20 minutes later, I was hit. It was a fire from our left flank, and I was struck first in my left and then in my right leg, but both nearly at the same time. He was taken to the makeshift hospital at the seminary where he would lie on the floor in his own blood for two days before receiving treatment, which ultimately was an amputation of his right leg below the knee and his left ankle was shattered beyond repair. By the end of the first day's fighting, 75% of these infantrymen were lost. The dead included Academy graduate Reginald Calpland of the 121st. He was later reburied at the National Cemetery at Gettysburg, and he ranked as the acting Sergeant Major when he was killed. In the 151st, Academy student William Noble was shot in the foot, and other casualties from his Company D were Juniata County men Samuel Leister and Ephraim Geyer, both ancestors of two of our Juniata County Historical Society board members. Leister was killed in action, and it is presumed um, that he is also among the, those buried at Gettysburg National Cemetery. 
Geyer was shot in the chest and later transferred from a Gettysburg hospital to a York hospital where he died eight weeks after being shot. His case was actually used for a Civil War medical journal and um, it details the extent of his situation. Adding insult to injury, Company D's term of service was due to end just three and a half weeks later. But Gettysburg saw to it that many of those men never saw that date. In the evening of July 1st, the few remaining men in these regiments withdrew through town and made their way to join other Union troops over on Cemetery Hill. Now they stayed in that position until about the close of the second day. Then on the final day of the battle, which we will get into later, they moved quickly to try to help repel that final grand charge. 151st Pennsylvania Regiment was given praise from General Doubleday, who said the men won an imperishable fame for defending the First Corps, despite being vastly outnumbered that day, and who, with its shattered remains, still flung itself into that last bloody charge on the third day. He believed that they were the chief instruments to save the Army of the Potomac, and the country from unimaginable disaster. The monuments in Gettysburg for the 8th Illinois Cavalry and the 151st and 121st Pennsylvania Infantries, they are all located along Reynolds Avenue in positions that they occupied that day. So this is a photo of the dedication of the 151st monument. The arrow is pointing to McPherson on crutches. And this is also um, a second photo from that same dedication. Now, he spoke at that dedication saying that on that day to the hour, 25 years ago, we were engaged in severe and deadly battle with a brave and determined, though mistaken, foe for the preservation of our national union and the inestimable blessings it secures. At the end of this video, there will be brief alumni updates to talk about the lives that these survivors went on to live after the Battle of Gettysburg. Through the night, reinforcements arrived for both armies. So by morning, the Union line, it went from Culp's Hill up around Cemetery Hill and down to Little Round Top, resembling kind of like a fish hook. So on day two, we will find our Tuscarora Academy alumni in five regiments positioned in the wheat field, in the peach orchard, and the surrounding guard around Little Round Top. None of these five regiments were at Gettysburg the previous day, but all of them heard the roar of battle echoing through the hills and valleys as they marched to join the defense of the Union. In fact, as one of these regiments were on the march, they passed the wagon carrying the body of General Reynolds who was killed on the first day. And one of the soldiers said, Boys, if the rebels are killing the generals, they will not have much respect for us little fellas. In this area, the fighting began around 4 p.m. and what followed within the next three hours was a fierce and sometimes savage battle with lots of confusion because control volleyed between the two sides multiple times. More than 20,000 men faced off on these 19 acres, and several of Tuscarora Academy's alumni were among them. In the 148th Pennsylvania Infantry Regiment, the Academy was represented by Captain William Potter Wilson in Company F. The Center County native had graduated from the Academy about a decade prior, and then he became a pharmacist until he enlisted, and he began rising through the officer ranks. A few months before Gettysburg, he was assigned to be an aide for their division's headquarters. Company G of the 148th was led by Captain James J. Patterson, and within his company was his younger brother, Sergeant Robert H. Patterson, and also Center County native Jacob B. Andrews. Now, as mentioned, Captain Patterson had graduated from Dickinson only four years earlier, and then he became a principal at Bullsburg Academy. So it was there that he helped raise Company G, and in which many of his students, including his little brother Robert, signed up to join him. 
The Patterson brothers were the sons of an original Academy trustee and the grandsons of the man who provided the money and the land to start Tuscarora Academy. Among the commanding officers of the 148th was future Pennsylvania Governor James Beaver and Academy graduate Robert A. McFarlane, who he had graduated um, from the Academy about 15 years earlier, and he was actually recovering from typhoid fever at the time Gettysburg started, and he really probably shouldn't have been returned to active duty yet, but there he was. So. Beaver was still recovering from the wounds he received at the Battle of Chancellorsville the previous month, so he actually wasn't in charge during Gettysburg. Uh, Colonel McKean took his place, but that was about to change. Together, these men in the 148th were called in to reinforce soldiers who had been fighting on the Rose family's wheat field. They worked to keep the Confederates from forming on the Stony Hill at the edge of the field, and then they joined up with the Irish Brigade along an old stone fence. Their brigade commander was actually mortally wounded at the wheat field, so when Colonel McKean uh, rose to took his spot, then our very own Lieutenant Colonel Robert McFarlane became the 148th commander. Here at the wheat field, Sergeant Robert Patterson was actually shot in the arm. In our Tuscarora Academy Museum, Robert's GAR uniform is on display. The jacket has his Civil War uniform infantry buttons, and the sergeant stripes that he was wearing at Gettysburg are crudely sewn into the sleeves of that jacket. Another wounded here was Academy graduate Jacob Andrews, whose left side was paralyzed with a shot. In the end, more than 4,000 men were shot down in the Rose's 19-acre field and nearby woods, which came to be known as the Bloody Wheat Field. We'll come back to revisit our friends from the 148th during tomorrow's battle. But assisting them around the wheat field area was the 13th Pennsylvania Reserves or the Bucktails. These Bucktails or the Cane Rifle Regiment, they were intended to include companies of skilled marksmen. They wore bucktails on their hats as a symbol of their marksmanship. Most of them were armed with breech-loading sharps rifles, which are normally only issued to sharpshooters. So in Company K was Academy graduate William Ross Hartshorn. The Clearfield County native had just graduated just a few years prior to the war. In Company G was Juniata County native James B. Thompson. So these bucktails arrived in Gettysburg on July 2nd, and from about 4 p.m. that day until the battle's conclusion the next day, they were in constant action. They made several very successful charges, and their fighting began around Little Round Top, where the regiment actually lost two of its commanders, which put Hartshorn in charge for the remainder of the battle. Next, they aided in pushing back waves of Confederate advances around the wheat field. This enabled those exhausted soldiers who had been on that wheat field fighting for the long haul, uh, enabled them to kind of come back and reform their lines. Now, the Bucktails accomplished this by charging across Plum Creek and Plum Creek Valley and finished their repulse at the stone wall on the east side of the wheat field. The hot fire from their Sharps rifles caused the rebels to retreat. Now by that time, the creek had already been running red with the blood of the killed and the wounded retreating from the wheat field, so it became known as Bloody Run in the Valley of Death. In the evening, the Bucktails moved to a position closer to Devil's Den along Houck's Ridge, where they held until the end of the battle. We'll come back to revisit them to see what they did here uh, when we start talking about day three. The monuments for the Bucktails and for the 148th are along Ayers Avenue and the Loop, which is near the corner of Sickles Avenue. The reason that I am including the information about the monuments for each of these alumni's regiments is just in case anybody wants to go visit Gettysburg and kind of immerse themselves in the experiences of these guys during those fateful days. Um, if you want to do that, then you have all the details right here. 
While the fighting in and around the wheat field was going down, in a nearby peach orchard, we will find Academy graduate William Meeker. He was under the command of famed Juniata County native Robert McAllister. He was an officer in the 11th New Jersey Infantry. They both were initially in the 1st New Jersey Company A, along with Meeker's brother Alvin, who also went to the academy. But a year before Gettysburg, Meeker and McAllister were transferred to Company B of the 11th New Jersey. Alvin had already been discharged prior to Gettysburg. So William Meeker was a New Jersey native. He had graduated from the academy several years prior and he was a captain of his company at Gettysburg. McAllister was a grandson of the original McAllister pioneer to Lost Creek in Juniata County. So in the late 1840s, he began contracting and building railroads with his brother. This work led to him living in New Jersey, um, and he was there when the time the war broke out. Growing up, he and this brother that he was partners with, Thompson, they studied military tactics together for fun. Uh, their grandfather, McAllister, had served with Washington in the Revolutionary War, so this kind of seems natural. But it really must have been heartbreaking for Robert McAllister when, in the first year of the war, he had to meet his brother on the battlefield as Thompson served for the state of Virginia. Meeker and McAllister and the rest of the 11th New Jersey's, their position changed several times on July 2nd because their Corps Commander General Sickles kind of disobeyed orders and moved his men to what he perceived to be a better position. Spoiler alert, it wasn't, but nevertheless, he moved the southern part of this fish hook further west to the peach orchard. Early that evening, the 11th New Jersey was attacked by Mississippi regiments on one side and Alabama regiments on another side. And all of this is, you know, while the wheat field battle is going on nearby. McAllister was actually shot in the left leg with a mini ball and in the right foot with a shell fragment. So he and another wounded officer were dragged off the field into McAllister's tent where they were laid up for the next five days. McAllister later wrote, so exciting was it all that I could not keep lying down, but had to jump up and watch the grand duel. McAllister was taken out of active battle for about 90 days while he recovered. But keep in mind, he is a 50 year old man at this time. His engraved walking cane is in the Historical Society's collection and it was donated by his granddaughter. Um, in the book that is filled with his Civil War letters, he wrote home to his wife about a conversation he had with another soldier, Academy student John McClay of Franklin County. He is quite a nice boy, 17 years old and a private. He tells me that he was at Tuscarora Academy and that nearly all the students old enough enlisted and are now in the Army. Meeker would go on to fight the next day, supporting artillery batteries during Pickett's Charge and the barrage preceding it. The monument for the 11th New Jersey is along Emmitsburg Road, just north of the Wheatfield Road. Speaking of New Jersey, a little further back to the east, we find the 2nd New Jersey Infantry and Academy graduate Theodore M. Tucker in Company K. After graduating from Tuscarora Academy a few years before the war, he had returned to New Jersey and worked as a blacksmith before entering to serve. His brigade arrived um, the end of the day on July 2nd. After sunset, they were moved around to the north side of Little Round Top, and then the next day they were moved near the Weikert Farm, which is where they took kind of minor casualties from artillery fire. Their monument, which is actually a monument to the whole 1st Brigade, um, including his um, regiment, that's located along Sedwick Avenue. Um, and after the war, actually, brigade survivors purchased the George Weikert farm so that they could preserve the defensive ground that they held at Gettysburg. They actually owned it until like, 1887 when they gave it to the Battlefield Memorial Association. Meanwhile, behind Little Round Top on July 2nd, guarding it against Confederate attacks from behind was the 49th Pennsylvania Infantry Regiment. In the 49th, we find three Academy alumni, Amore Wakefield, Joseph Barton, and Joseph Rupp. 
Amor Wakefield was a Mifflin County native who had graduated from the academy around 15 years prior. He was an established farmer when he enlisted to serve and he was promoted to officer positions. And he was a captain at the time of Gettysburg. Josiah Barton was a Juniata County native who graduated from the academy a few years before the war and then he worked as a teacher and helped his father's blacksmith shop. He was a quartermaster sergeant for the 49th. Joseph Rupp was a regimental musician. Before the war, he was given a Bible from academia pastor George Washington Thompson, and he carried it with him through all three years that he served, and it is still in the possession of his descendants today. Serving in the 49th with these academy graduates were Juniata County soldiers, William Mauger, Robert H. Taylor, David Bosser, James H. Patton, John Stewart, and Joseph B. Downing. The Historical Society's collection also has photographs of other officers of the 49th. Now these men weren't from Juniata County, which indicates that these photographs actually belong to one of our 49th members, um, and then it was later donated. John W. Russell from Westchester, Edward T. Swain from McVeytown, O.S. Rumberger from Huntington, and Thomas M. Hullings from Mifflin County, who was actually killed in war the next year, F.W. Wombacker from Lackawanna County, and Atchison McClellan from Huntington County. Now the 49th had received word on the evening of July 1st to quickly get to Gettysburg. And after a march of 34 miles, they arrived around 2 p.m. the second day and were placed behind Little Round Top, guarding it against Confederate attacks from the rear. They remained here until the afternoon of the following day when they were moved around to the right side. Now, during this time, they only suffered slightly by uh, the heavy artillery fire. Their monument is uh, was dedicated in 1889, and it's on Howe Avenue, just to the east of Tannytown Road, which runs behind Little Round Top. Joseph B. Dowling was a speaker at the dedication. So before we get to the final day, let's just take a quick moment to remember. This was July in Pennsylvania. These men were doing this brutal fighting in relentless heat and humidity in full uniform after marching an insane number of miles to get there. They were subsiding on a diet of things like spoiled meat, coffee, and hardtack, which is pictured here. They would uh, climb over dead bodies to get any drop of liquid they could find from the canteens of the fallen. Their level of exhaustion, discomfort, and anger at the cause, and sadness from being separated from their families, terror at what they were experiencing, and the anguish from seeing their comrades just mowed down right beside them. This is unimaginable on every level. So here we are at day three. Um, although the Battle of Culp's Hill began the night of the previous day, it was reignited around 5.30 that morning and it lasted through the morning hours of the third. In that fight was the Confederate Unit 27th Virginia and Academy graduate Adam C. Snyder was in that in Company E. They were called the Greenbrier Rifles. So after graduating from Tuscarora Academy, he went on to attend Dickinson College, but as tensions heated up, he actually transferred to a university in his home state of Virginia. There he studied law and he became an attorney before enlisting in Stonewall's Brigade and eventually becoming a captain. So although his regiment actually arrived at nightfall on July 1st after a 25 mile march, they spent most of the second day along Hanover Road taking part in skirmishes while being on guard. After sundown on the 2nd, they were moved to join other Confederate units to aid with the failed attack on Culp's Hill, um, because by the time that they arrived, the attack had stalled for the night. So now here at daybreak on July 3rd, it was back in full motion and it continued from about 5.30 in the morning until around noon and had very heavy casualties. The marker for this Walker slash Stonewall Brigade is um, on East Confederate Avenue. Longstreet's assault, Pickett's charge, 
Lee's Big Brass Balls, no matter what you call it, this uh, climactic event is the one that everybody thinks of when they think of the Battle of Gettysburg. So it started around one o'clock that afternoon of July 3rd with a devastating barrage of artillery from the Confederates onto the Union line along Cemetery Ridge. So about an hour after this constant firing, more than 11,000 Confederate soldiers stepped out from the tree line to charge across a mile of open ground towards the Union line. Their end goal was to reach a clump of trees in the center of that line. On their journey over the open field, they were hit with long-range artillery and it created very large gaps in their lines. The remaining Confederates reached the Union's stone wall late in the afternoon, which then resulted in some very brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat. In the end, the Union prevailed and the remaining Confederates either retreated or were captured or did not survive it. So let's talk about which of our Academy graduates participated in this cataclysmic event. So here are the first two from the Confederate side. In Pickett's division of Longstreet's Corps was former Academy student Randolph Shotwell, whom we already talked about. Um, he was in the 8th Virginia Company H Garnet's Brigade. Born in what is now West Virginia, he eventually moved with his family to Mifflin County when his widowed father remarried. This is when he and his brother attended the academy. So even though I've already talked about him, I thought it was worth mentioning that although he was basically raised in the North, his loyalties were clearly with the South. His regiment didn't arrive at Gettysburg until the evening of the 2nd, so since Lee was looking for fresh troops to break through the Union's line, the 8th Virginia fit that bill. Garnet, the brigade commander, he thought that the plan was a desperate thing to attempt, and he did not survive the charge. But Randy Shotwell did, despite his regiment having about 90% casualties. Also in the charge was David Stone, who has already made appearances in this story, but he was in the 47th Virginia Company G, Brock and Brawls Brigade. Um, he was born, as we said, in Norfolk, Virginia, and he was sent north to Tuscarora Academy in the early 1850s. And as mentioned, he basically put down some roots in Juniata County. But despite this and marrying a Northern girl, here we find him on the opposite side. So you may remember that his regiment was also in the thick of the battle on the first day, which saw the death of many Juniata County soldiers, as well as Stone's brigade commander's brother. So they stayed in reserve on the second day, but on this final day, we find him on this field, marching off into posterity, now under uh, Pettigrew's command. So during the charge, they were hit with a very heavy shelling from the Union artillery. When they became surrounded by an Ohio regiment, they turned and ran, uh, suffering only about 20% casualties. The two Confederate markers for uh, the group that Stone was with and the group that Shotwell was with, um, including the one for the entire state of Virginia that has Lee on the top of it with his horse traveler, uh, these are located along West Confederate Avenue, which is where these men, uh, the tree line that they emerged from, uh, heading towards Emmitsburg Road and Cemetery Ridge. Both of these Confederate students were captured in later engagements and served time at Fort Delaware. Together, probably. Stone was actually very likely one of Shotwell's teachers during his last session at Tuscarora Academy. They were two Southern men with very different ideologies. So even though they both fought for the same cause, Stone returned to academia and by all appearances, harbored little to no resentment of Northerners living in the North for the remainder of his life. Shotwell, however, he remained extremely bitter against the North and very radical in his ideologies. And he eventually, no surprise, became affiliated with the Ku Klux Klan. 
Okay, back to the charge. On the receiving end of these visitors from the south, we find some of the soldiers that we've already mentioned on the previous days, like William Meeker of the 11th New Jersey. He was there from start to finish that day. His regiment suffered about 56% losses. Our friends from the 148th Pennsylvania also took on the pre-shelling and assisted with the reception of Lee's men. William Potter Wilson, Robert A. McFarlane, Captain James J. Patterson, Sergeant Robert H. Patterson, and Jacob B. Andrews. Thankfully for them, the heaviest part of that action took place to their right. Also, what little remained of the 151st Pennsylvania, they were also here continuing to fight while their commander, uh, Robert McFarland, uh, he was still in that makeshift hospital at the seminary. Close behind those guys were the 1st Pennsylvania Cavalry. Even though they were typically with the rest of the cavalry, at Gettysburg, they were assigned to guard the headquarters of General Meade at the Leicester Farm. In Company A and C, we find many graduates of Tuscarora Academy. In fact, the 1st Pennsylvania was commanded by Colonel John P. Taylor of Mifflin County, who had attended the academy nearly 20 years prior. He was a farmer and a stock dealer before the war. The other academy students under his command in um, the other company were John M. Brzee, James R. Kelly, Samuel B. Okison, John Hamilton, Samuel L. Patterson, and brothers Lemuel R. and James Harvey Beale. Now, it's worth mentioning that there were two other Juniata County soldiers with them, newspaper man William Jackman, who was at that time editor of The True Democrat, and David H. Wilson, whose death during the war led to the Mifflintown GAR post being named after him. It's also worth noting that Company A was raised by Colonel Taylor in Mifflin County, while Company C was raised by Colonel John K. Robison of Juniata County. Robison actually enlisted 63 men for his company, but the month before Gettysburg, he was transferred to the 16th Pennsylvania Cavalry, which we will get into in a bit. Allow me to make a quick introduction for each of these seven academy students that were originally recruited by Robison. Lemuel R. Beale had attended the academy about five years before the war. His brother, James Harvey Beale, also attended the academy and then he stayed on as an assistant teacher. He then graduated from Union Theological Seminary in New York and he was the chaplain for this cavalry regiment but he was also known to take up arms. So this earned him the nickname from his fellow soldiers, the Fighting Chaplain. John Brzee was born in Western Pennsylvania, but he moved to academia after his father's death when his mother married an academy trustee. James R. Kelly, he was a farmer before serving in the war and he later became an academy trustee. Uh, Samuel B. Okison, he attended the academy about five years before the war, as did uh, Samuel L. Patterson. Um, he was actually, but Patterson was actually working as a clerk before enlisting. Then we have John Hamilton, who had just finished his education at the academy when he enlisted. These men reached the field the morning of the second day. Um, that evening, the Confederates had attempted to attack them, but a charge from the 1st Pennsylvania Cavalry kind of hurled them back. So now on this third day, they were all at the rear guard of the left center line guarding Meade's headquarters. At the opening of the artillery fire that afternoon, they were given orders from General Meade to charge the assaulting column should it succeed in breaking the infantry line in the front. When the battle reached their position, they were exposed to the full force of the terrific storm, but they withstood until withdrawn from the range of that blasting, withering stream of death. When it became clear that the rebels were defeated, the shouts of victory, first starting from Cemetery Hill, were caught up by division after division and echoing from line to line and core to core until the hills and woods and the whole broad country covered by our vast army rung with one long, loud shout of triumph, a shout that filled all hearts with rejoicing 
that made the wounded forget their anguish. The day was won. Their monument is located along Hancock Avenue near the high water mark and copse of trees. It was dedicated in 1890 and the fighting chaplain spoke at the dedication, stating that after 27 years, our steeds are dust, all have done their work. We pray and hope the circumstances may never arise that will call our weapons forth in deadly strife again. He hoped that their monument and all the others would be a place where generations yet unborn may come and read and make their offering at the soldier's shrine, and their proudest boast will be that their sires stood here on the third day of July 1863 in the vortex of war and fought for liberty and union. Meanwhile, further east of town, the Confederate cavalry was set up and ready in case that their infantry was able to break the Union line after that charge. Here, under Jeb Stewart's division, was the 10th Virginia Cavalry, in which was Academy graduate John P. Schirmerhorn. He was born near Richmond, Virginia, and graduated from the Academy about five years before the war began. His brigade, up until the previous month, had been led by General Lee's son, but was now under Colonel Chambliss. The 10th Virginia arrived at Gettysburg on the 2nd, but it did not engage until this third and final day. While that bloody charge was taking place to their west, some of these men were serving as sharpshooters in the vicinity of the Rummel Barn, but most of them participated in the charges made here by the cavalry during the afternoon. Even if the rebels would have broken the Union line successfully as Lee had hoped, the Confederate cavalry would have been no help because they were quickly blocked by the Union cavalry, including Custer and his Wolverines, and a Pennsylvania cavalry, which we will discuss next. Um, the marker for Sherman Horn's unit um, is also at East Cavalry Field. The 16th Pennsylvania Cavalry was also in place for that final day out here. This is where Juniata County's Colonel John K. Robison was transferred as commander the month before. The regiment's commissary was Academy graduate William McDowell, and in Company F, it was filled with other Juniata County soldiers, including Samuel F. Miller, which is my husband's third great grandfather. Although the 16th Pennsylvania Cavalry had arrived the day before, on this final day, they were in line east of town and under some artillery fire, but they weren't directly in the worst of that cavalry fighting. McDowell, a Mifflin County native, would also later become a brother-in-law to both Captain James Patterson and David Stone. He attended the academy about a decade prior and then became a teacher there. He went on to graduate from Yale, second in his class. He continued teaching and also was studying law before enlisting to serve in the war. His commissary ledger from his time in the service is still proudly in the possession of his descendants today. John Kincaid Robison was a Juniata County native who became a highly respected military man. Shortly after the war, he represented the area in the state Senate and also worked for two of Pennsylvania's governors. Also in the 16th Cavalry were two other notable Juniata Countyans. The first is the regiment's chief bugler. He, his name is Ferdinand Fritz Rome. 
Um, he later actually saved the life of future Pennsylvania Governor Beaver of the 148th Regiment um, at Reams Station. Fritz Rome received a Medal of Honor for this act, and his bravery was never forgotten by Beaver, who later made Fritz the Sergeant of the Guard for the Pennsylvania Capitol Police. And Fritz held this job until he died of a heart attack in the State Capitol Rotunda while he was on duty. The other private was Jacob Beadler of Juniata County. Excerpts from Beadler's diary shed some light on the activity of the 16th Pennsylvania Cavalry. July 1st, this is while they were marching to Gettysburg, my horse gave out at nine and I left him with all my clothes and then took it on foot. We marched all day and night. July 2nd, my feet are very sore. We marched and marched and stopped a short distance from Gettysburg heavy fighting here we can see it we landed here at 4 p.m i am still on foot i am not very well july 3rd we were roused up by the roar of cannon at 4 30 a.m the fighting was very heavy all day but from about 1 p.m until 4 p.m it was one continuous roar of cannon the loss of men here this day was very heavy on both sides our division of cavalry was on the extreme right. I was not along, for I had no horse. July 4th. Last night, the rebels left and retreated, leaving their dead and wounded all back. The battlefield looks very hard. Thousands of men laying dead. This is a monument for the 16th Pennsylvania Cavalry. It was dedicated in 1889. And then this is what is called um, Greg's uh, Cavalry Shaft or um, Monument. So it um, was the very first monument out at Gettysburg to honor both Union and Confederates together uh, when it was dedicated in 1884. So it includes um, all of the cavalry units that were out there fighting that third day, which includes both the names of Custer and our very own John K. Robison. Before we end this bloody day and this bloody battle, I do have to mention that while this was all going on, um, our bucktails of the 13th Pennsylvania Reserves, including William Rush Hartshorn and James B. Thompson, they had spent most of that morning dealing with the annoyance of the Confederate sharpshooters around Devil's Den, devoting themselves to picking off their antagonists whenever chances offered. Then, after the Union successfully repulsed uh, Lee's Confederate assault, the Bucktails were ordered to clear the surrounding woods, driving Confederate forces out of the Wheatfield and the Devil's Den area. In this final advance, Sergeant Thompson captured the flag of the 15th Georgia, later being awarded the Medal of Honor for capturing this flag. Sometime after Gettysburg, Thompson was captured and spent seven months as a prisoner of war. And then after the war, he returned home to Port Royal, where he was first a carriage maker and then worked at uh, a bank. His sister, Belle, was a well-known volunteer Civil War nurse. That night, it rained. Like at the end of every movie that has a horrific anxiety-ridden scene, it rained as if washing away all of the evils of the last few days. As the fighting chaplain described it, the rain that descended that night bathed the burning, aching wounds, cooled the parched and fevered tongue, and washed the bloody faces of the dead. On July 4th, our nation's birthday, all was quiet at Gettysburg. Everybody was exhausted from the previous three days. As the Confederates retreated, we have one more Academy graduates adventure to mention. In the 1st Maryland Cavalry was George M. Emack and Company B. They were at Gettysburg all three days, but mainly worked as carriers and artillery support and saw little to no mounted action. 
Emac was a native of Maryland and attended the academy in the years leading up to the war. He was even one of the top students, earning himself a private room in the old stone jug. But he was virtually fearless, dangerously so. As the Confederates retreated, Emac and a small number of men were the rear guards protecting the vulnerable Confederate wagon train filled with their supplies. They were near Monterey Pass in Franklin County, Pennsylvania around 9 p.m. that rainy night on July 4th. Custer's Wolverine Cavalry approached and despite being very outnumbered, Emac made a very determined stand and ordered that they fire their one and only cannon. Now keep in mind, Emac had like 20 guys and just this one cannon, but it was very dark and rainy. So the confused and surprised Union cavalrymen were convinced that they were under siege by a much larger force and a six hour standoff ensued. By 3 a.m., the Union ended up capturing miles of rebel supply wagons and took many prisoners. Emac was shot in both arms, in one hand, and got some shrapnel in his knee and had some sword wounds on his shoulder. His horse was also shot out from under him. He later said that the loss of the horse, which was a gift from a family friend, was a worse pain than his wounds. Meanwhile, back at Gettysburg, our friend William McDowell, the commissary, he received word from a citizen that a rebel officer was hiding in a nearby barn. McDowell investigated and the report turned out to be true. There he discovered the bridge burning Confederate officer, Isaac Trimble with an amputated leg, which was the result of his wound from the great charge of that final day. Trimble asked him to deliver a message to General George Meade relating to a secret favor that Trimble's father did for Meade's father many years before. McDowell delivered the message to Meade, who then ensured that Trimble received the very best medical care before sending him to prison. On July 6, Captain Patterson sat down and wrote a very detailed letter to his wife. It contains many statistics and information that Civil War buffs would love, but for the sake of this story, here are the pertinent excerpts. Of particular note is the care that he still had for his friend and brother-in-law, David Stone. My dear Lizzie, we have just gotten through the severest battle this army has yet fought, and we have gained a glorious victory and driven the invaders from our soil. The carnage was terrible. If you could see this field, you would be surprised at the number of slaughtered men. Our regiment fought splendidly. My brother Bob was wounded in the arm, severe, but will not lose it, is in the hospital at Gettysburg. I am very sorry for Bob. Still, he will ultimately be none the worse for his wound. Your brother John is not hurt, but is a prisoner in the hands of Lee. He was taken in the fight on the 1st of July. I have been again mercifully spared and kept in safety through this terrible battle. We fought the Virginians and cut it all to pieces. I looked over the dead for stone, but I did not find him, nor did I find him among the wounded. Perhaps he is a prisoner. He, I hope, is in the later party, but I fear for him, for his regiment had a rough time of it. I think if he had a fair chance, he could be taken prisoner, and he certainly had all the chance he could ask for. In fact, it could be difficult for him to escape. Such hard marching, fighting, and loss of sleep and exposure to wet weather has made us stupid so that all we think of much is rest and sleep. I will close. Goodbye, my dear Lizzie. Yours in trough, James. Although telegram wires had been cut, word of mouth spread quickly around central Pennsylvania. But what reached the ears of those in southwestern end of Juniata County before the word of mouth was the awful sounds of that battle echoing off the surrounding ridges and carried by the wind. The father of Captain and Sergeant Patterson of the 148th, John Patterson, a longtime Academy trustee, heard it all from his home in Piru Mills and sprang into action to help, as many other concerned citizens did who could easily travel to Gettysburg. John and a few other men gathered up all the linen and food they could haul and headed towards Gettysburg to help tend to the wounded, including his son Robert, who they found nursing that shot to his arm. 
While there, the Juniata County helpers used every bit of linen that they had taken with them for bandages and then resorted to using scraps from their own undergarments. Another trustee, an academia pastor, George W. Thompson, also went to Gettysburg to aid both spiritually and physically to the wounded and dying left behind. In this duty, he contracted an illness that led to his death six months later. There were academy students who went as well. Here are two very abbreviated stories which appear in more detail in chapter four of my Tuscarora Academy book. Clayton Schertz and David Unger were academy students from Mercersburg. The closeness of their homes to where the rebel army was caused restlessness and anxiousness that even though they were in the middle of their school session, nothing less than a trip home would cure. They met up with two other recent academy graduates, Hans Boyd and Samuel Patterson, and made their way. When they reached Upper Strasburg, they were at a hotel sitting on the porch when two companies of rebel cavalry dashed into town. The officers stopped in front of the hotel and pointed their guns, demanding to know which way the Yanks had gone. The boys reported feeling paralyzed with fear, wishing that they could sink into the floor and disappear. As the officers relaxed, gradually the hearts of our boys began to beat again, and they felt more and more at ease as they became better acquainted with these sons of the South. But it was a terrible introduction for a pair of such unsophisticated youths. The next morning, they hit the road again, but encountered a warlike scene with hundreds of Confederate infantry soldiers. So they hid in a shed and waited until it was clear. When they emerged, they were suddenly confronted by two remaining rebels who had branched off from the main body in quest of something to eat and drink. There was not much in the appearance of these men to frighten anybody. So in answer to the question, what are you doing here? Unger told them the straight story, that they had been at school and were making their way home. A friendly conversation followed in which the boys in gray said that they had also been attending school in Virginia and left to enter the army. They were tired of it and wished that the war was over. Unger offered up his beverage and they all took a drink. And although they were on different sides of the national question, each one said, here's success to you. Goodbyes were said and they parted in peace the one party going to their homes and the other to another battlefield. Our next story features George Wilds Lynn, who was a native of Path Valley in Franklin County. He was a student at the academy when the news of Gettysburg reached campus. Here are excerpts from his account of his youthful journey that he gave 50 years later. One bright morning, the unwelcome news was flashed upon us that a great enemy was marching across the line of the Mason and Dixon and threatening our firesides. Instantly, a new and grave responsibility overpowered us. The fascination of books and of ball games during recreation hours suddenly vanished. The loud call of the state for emergency men filled our souls to the exclusion of everything else. The comforts of a quiet, peaceful life were ignored and one thought alone engaged us, the danger which threatened our beloved country. When the battle was over, we resolved that though we had not been able to enlist as embryo soldiers, we would go to Gettysburg as individuals. They reached Cashtown Monday night and then on Tuesday morning, July 7th, they were on their way to the fateful field. While walking by what is now Reynolds Woods, they saw, hundreds of Confederate soldiers who had been too seriously wounded to be removed when Lee's ambulances left on Saturday night. They were laying in the open without shelter, many dying for lack of food and attention. They found McPherson's barn converted into a hospital. Poor fellows were lying about with wan faces and listless eyes, waiting their turn and seemingly indifferent to whether they lived or died. Great gaping wounds were seen unbandaged for lack of dressings, while maggots and flies tormented the suffering. He recalled the sounds of amputated limbs being tossed into a cart. With a dull, sickening thud, the legs and arms of these victims of cruel warfare. When they made it to the wheat field and peach orchard, they found that some of the dead were still laying in secluded places overlooked in the haste of burial. In three days, a beautiful landscape, four miles long and half as wide, 
had been transformed into a veritable hell on earth, where the groans of the suffering, the gasps of the dying with pallid features and glazed eyes, pictured to my mind the brutal inhumanity of man to man with a force and vividness which nothing short of death can erase. And that was war, glorious war. In his conclusion, he felt as though 50 years later, the nation had learned nothing. It was forging even greater, more advanced guns and battleships while glibly speaking of peace. There is in us all that strange and universal mental reservation echoed in the diatom. Self-preservation is the first law of human nature. Gettysburg was the bloodiest single battle in the entire Civil War, with more than 50,000 estimated killed and wounded. Tuscarora Academy's students, who became veterans of the Great War, also had some interesting numbers, including at least two students who switched sides throughout the duration of the war. Juniata County Historical Society's past volunteers compiled information on more than 1,800 Civil War veterans who lived here. So if you want to learn more about any of them, including the 25 Pennsylvania regiments that contained companies of men that were at least partially recruited here, researchers are welcome to visit our archives to learn more. After the war, surviving soldiers formed fraternal organizations, with the most notable being the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic. With the motto of fraternity, loyalty, and charity, the profound camaraderie that they felt with each other, friendships forged in battle, was a unique bond that could not be broken or replicated with anyone else who didn't have those same shared experiences. Membership was limited strictly to what they called Veterans of the Late Unpleasantness. There were four GAR posts in Juniata County, all named for soldiers who did not survive the war. There was one in Mifflintown, Oriental, McCullough's Mills, and Richfield. The GAR was instrumental in getting government pensions for veterans and pushed for the annual observance of Decoration Day, which we now know as Memorial Day. Another legacy that they left was promoting and establishing soldiers' orphans' homes. Lieutenant Colonel Robert McFarland, whom we discussed from the 151st Pennsylvania on the first day of the battle, he turned his McAllisterville Academy into one of the very first soldiers' orphan schools in 1864. The GAR raised funds to build monuments and memorials dedicated to their fallen comrades. So at Gettysburg, there are now more than 1,300 monuments, markers, and memorials. Mifflin County's John P. Taylor even served as the president for the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Commission. Veterans returned to Gettysburg in 1888 for the 25th anniversary. So by then or shortly thereafter, many of the regimental monuments had already been erected and there are photos of the survivors at their monuments dedication. Veterans had many reunions anywhere really. So it was like any chance they could get to get together to swap their war stories or share their heartaches. So when Gettysburg's 50th anniversary came around in 1913, more than 53,000 veterans attended the reunion. 22,000 of those were from Pennsylvania. Photographs from that event are moving, very, very emotional. So it was as hot at that reunion as it was on the battlefield 50 years earlier, and it proved too much for some. Nine veteran guests died during the event. Academy graduate George Walls was one of them. Imagine being taken out by the heat in the sun at the same place that you survived the hell of war 50 years earlier.
So real quick before we move on to the where are they now wrap up, we have to briefly talk about the Pennsylvania Memorial. It is the largest one there at Gettysburg and it took five years to complete. An interesting fact about the winged victory statue at the top is that it's made from melted down Civil War cannons. More than 34,000 names appear on this monument and it's the names of those who fought at Gettysburg arranged by their regiment. So there have been some misspellings and other omissions that were proven over the years, but park policy will not allow any corrections or additions. So instead they keep an updated list at the visitor center. Another reason to bring up this amazing piece of architecture is because 1905 Academy graduate Margaret Ann Okeson was married to an engineer who was involved with the design of the Pennsylvania Memorial. Okay, as promised, I'm going to close with some quick updates on the lives that the survivors went on to live. The 8th Illinois Cavalry, of which Jeremiah Jordan was in, participated in the hunt for John Wilkes Booth, and they also served as the honor guard for President Lincoln as he laid in state at the Capitol and also on his funeral train. After the war, Jeremiah returned to Illinois, where he was a carpenter for a while, before relocating to a farm in South Dakota. William P. Noble after his enlistment ended and his foot wound from the first day's battle healed, he went home and went to Tuscarora Academy, later working as an assistant teacher there. He became a doctor and practiced in Franklin County for more than 50 years. Robert A. McFarlane returned to Center County where he was a merchant and worked other odd jobs as well. William Potter Wilson continued in service to his country as an officer in the United States Army. He then moved to Trenton, New Jersey, where he worked as a clerk, later relocating to Warm Springs, Virginia. After the war, Jacob Boyd Andrews returned to Tuscarora Academy as a teacher. He eventually became a minister preaching in Wisconsin before relocating to preach in California. The effects of his wound from Gettysburg still troubled him throughout his life. A few months after Gettysburg, Major William Ross Hartshorn married Alice Brzee of Academia, whom he had likely met while attending school there. She was a sister of John Brzee of the 1st Pennsylvania Cavalry. Now, despite being a newlywed, uh, Hartshorn remained an officer in military service. He was later captured and held prisoner for six months. Then after the war, Hartshorn's military reputation meant that he was well connected. In 1871, an excitement occurred when General George Meade was passing through and he stopped to have dinner with him. Hartshorn went on to serve as a representative in the state legislature and then worked on the staffs of four governors. He also worked as the state superintendent of public buildings and grounds for 13 years. He served several years as a trustee of Tuscarora Academy and sent all three of his daughters to go to school there. Captain James J. Patterson continued his leadership in more battles. At the Spotsylvania Courthouse, he even captured his friend and brother-in-law, David Stone, and sent him off to Fort Delaware. Then, after being shot in the leg at Petersburg, the captain was unable to return to active service. Then, after the war, miraculously, he and Stone became co-principals of Tuscarora Academy. Like, bygones! <laughs> Patterson was a lifelong educator, eventually moving to Nebraska, Oklahoma, and Arkansas. When speaking about his time in the Civil War, he said, I would be no fair arbiter. I had many close friends on both sides. In 1933, Patterson was honored by Dickinson College at their 150th commencement. He was the oldest living alumni. It had been 74 years since he graduated. As for his brother Robert, the year after Gettysburg, he was badly wounded at the Battle of Cold Harbor while attempting to grab a rebel flag. After the war, he returned to his family homestead and took over the operation of the Patterson store at Piru Mills. As mentioned, David Stone was captured at Spotsylvania by his own brother-in-law and served time at Fort Delaware. 
After the war, he became principal of Tuscarora Academy, first as co-principal with his brother-in-law, William McDowell, then as co-principal with his brother-in-law, Captain Patterson, and then finally as the sole principal. It was under his leadership that the school became co-educational and welcomed this first female scholars in 1873. Then later in the late 1870s, he moved to Mifflin Town and practiced law for a decade before relocating to Washington, D.C., where he entered the real estate business as a broker. After the war, William McDowell resumed his law studies and became a lawyer. He also joined his brother-in-law, David Stone, as co-principal of Tuscarora Academy for a year. He later moved to Fayette County and became the editor of a Uniontown newspaper called The Genius of Liberty. After the war, William Meeker was initially a real estate clerk before getting into the insurance business. He later became a broker and a chairman of a company in Newark. Theodore Tucker was severely wounded the following year at the Battle of the Wilderness and suffered the effects for the rest of his life. Nevertheless, he returned to his blacksmith work in New Jersey and worked for a company that manufactured fluting machines used to launder clothing as well as printing machines. Joseph Rupp moved to Ohio and worked for a streetcar company. Then he moved to Utah, where he was an assistant jailer and a carpenter. Decades later, he returned to Pennsylvania to seek health treatment from Pennsylvania's veteran hospitals. A more Wakefield was badly wounded during a Virginia battle when a tree fell on him. A couple of months later, he was captured and spent nearly six months in Confederate prisons. After the war, he returned to farm life and eventually relocated to Kansas, where he was active in the GAR and elected to three terms in the district court. The year after Gettysburg, Josiah Barton was promoted to lieutenant and then was wounded and taken prisoner at the Spotsylvania Courthouse. He was wrongly reported as killed in action and then mourned by his fellow soldiers as well as his family and friends back home. But meanwhile, he was being moved between six different prisons in three different states over a 10-month period before he was exchanged. When he returned home, he had the unique experience of reading his own obituaries and memorials. After the war, he opened a general store in Pleasant View, which was just a few miles away from the academy. He served as a postmaster, and he also was a Tuscarora Academy trustee for more than 30 years. He even sent each and every one of his children to school there, and his daughter Ida became the school's first female principal. Josiah was also active with the Juniata Valley Bank and served for five years as a county associate judge. Adam Snyder was captured a short time after Gettysburg and imprisoned until the following year. After the war, he was disbarred due to his Confederate service, so he worked as a journalist until the disbarment was lifted. His home state split during the war, so where he lived became West Virginia, where he was eventually appointed as a judge of its Supreme Court. Randolph Shotwell was later captured and imprisoned at Fort Delaware. After the war, he moved to North Carolina, where he traded his war sword for the weapon he would use for the remainder of his life, a pen. As the editor of several newspapers, he engaged in political warfare using the press. His bold assertions gained him as many followers as it did enemies. He was elected to one term in the state legislature and was later appointed as the state librarian. With his radical ideologies, it's no surprise that he was eventually associated with the Ku Klux Klan. He was a part of a mob that was charged with the attempted murder of a North Carolina state representative. John P. Taylor returned to Mifflin County. His distinguished record as a soldier earned him a wide respect. He was active in the GAR, even becoming the department commander of the overarching Pennsylvania GAR. He was also the president of the Gettysburg Memorial Commission. He ordered his own casket to be cast from the melted down metal of a Civil War cannon that had been captured from the Confederate Army. Lemuel Beale returned to Juniata County, where he was a lifelong farmer. His brother, James Harvey Beale, the fighting chaplain, continued his ministry and lived in Philadelphia and later Delaware. He was often the minister leading prayers for various Gettysburg reunion ceremonies. John Brissy went on to study medicine and became a physician in academia, and all three of his children attended the academy. 
James R. Kelly, was shot in the leg after Gettysburg and later captured. He spent time in three Confederate prisons, including the infamous Libby Prison in Virginia. After the war, he returned home to Juniata County, where he was a farmer. He was also an academy trustee, active in the GAR, and held various local offices, including the high sheriff. Later, he briefly located to Kansas before settling in California, where he took up fruit farming, specializing in apricots, oranges, and walnuts. Samuel B. Okeson returned to Juniata County and took up farming, but he died six years after the war ended. John Hamilton went to the Agricultural College of Pennsylvania, which we know today as Penn State University. He went on to become a professor there and was very involved with the college's operation, serving as its treasurer for 37 years. His academic agricultural work was so respected that he was later appointed as Pennsylvania's Secretary of the Department of Agriculture. Also caught the eye of the United States Department of Agriculture, so they selected him as a specialist for their farmers' institutes, and he was the first of the specialists to include women in the programs by recruiting farmers' wives to give presentations about household economics and farm beautification. Samuel L. Patterson relocated to Illinois where he was an agent for a sewing machine company. He later moved to Ohio and took up carpentry. John P. Shermerhorn experienced some tension within the ranger unit that he was serving during the war. He discovered that his colonel was involved in fraudulent activities like ordering expensive provisions and weapons for 150 recruitments that it turned out didn't exist. So Shermerhorn tried to tell the general and asked to be transferred to another unit, but the general wasn't interested and told him to better keep quiet and just return to his unit. So the um, colonel then said if he didn't keep quiet, he would be shot. Shermerhorn was not satisfied being associated with that level of corruption and threats, so he called in a favor with Jefferson Davis, which he had earned when Mrs. Davis was thrown from her carriage and Shermerhorn happened to be the one that came to her aid. So Davis saw to uh, Shermerhorn's honorable discharge from the corrupt unit, so he was then free to re-enlist in another and he served until the end of the war. He returned home to Virginia and was a lifelong farmer and an active member of the Grange. George M. Emack. Before Gettysburg, he served as a Confederate spy. His overboldness caused him to be captured. While he was being transported, his capturer stopped at a hotel and three men were put on duty to guard him. Emack was somehow able to get a knife and overtake his guards by stabbing them. As he ran away, the shots rang out behind him, but he managed to escape unharmed. He then became the second in command at Libby Prison in Virginia, where he was a well-known torturer of the Union prisoners. He eventually left his position to join the cavalry. And we already talked about his overboldness in the Gettysburg retreat at Monterey Pass. There are many historians who speculate that he was also involved in the assassination plot of Lincoln. In fact, members of his cavalry company helped Booth escape after the assassination. One of the Confederate veteran reunion posts in Maryland was named for Emac. And last, we have George Wilde's Lynn. Despite the carnage he saw at Gettysburg as a student, he still later enlisted and he served until the end of the war. Afterward, he went to college, studied medicine internationally, and became a doctor in Philadelphia. He also lived for a time in Colorado and Los Angeles, where he was briefly a professor at the University of Southern California. He retired to Malvern, PA, and became an author who published books on his first-hand accounts of the Civil War, on science and religion, and on the genealogy of the Lynn family. I hope you've enjoyed this um, hour and 20 minute long presentation filled with all sorts of information. And now I guess we can say that uh, Juniata County and Tuscarora Academy have their very own full length history documentary.